Whew, man. Uh, what can be said about The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild that hasn't already been covered by every video game reviewer, player, YouTuber, etc.? Well, I'd say quite a bit. Uh, as you most probably know, this game has been very, 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 very well received. Uh, some have gone as far as to call it perfect. Uh, a 10 out of 10, as they say. Well, I disagree. Now, before you burst into flames and immediately smash that dislike button, I'm in no way saying this is a bad game. It's not. It was a lot of fun. It was truly a great experience playing through it. However, during my travel across this vast wilderness of this newly imagined Hyrule, I always felt that there was something missing. But you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's go back, like, like way back, like 1986. How many of you played the original Legend of Zelda growing up on the NES? Now, did you play as a child, like, as you were growing up, or did you play it more recently, uh, even maybe after playing some of the more modern games, like on the N64 and beyond? When you started the series, I feel it will definitely have an effect on your playthrough of Breath of the Wild, at least to some degree. You see, I started with Zelda 1. I played with my parents growing up as a toddler, and I loved it. Uh, from there, I moved on to Zelda 2, which I also loved even though I think it's entirely too popular to hate on that game, just like it's entirely too popular to hate on Simon's Quest, but that's a video for another time. Uh, eventually, I moved on to you know, the SNES. With each iteration, there was more and more to love. Uh, you know, with the original game, we were given a world with no direction we could set out in any way we wanted to go, and it was an awesome experience. Do you make a beeline for Dungeon 1, or do you explore the whole world and try to find hearts and other goodies? Maybe you found Dungeon 2 and 3 first, and you decided you want to check them out. These were all choices given to us in the year 1986. The sequel, well, we all know it's, it's rather linear and gets a lot of slack for completely changing the gameplay, even though it did create a lot of ideas for future games. Uh, but even with that, it, it kind of started us down that more linear path. Uh, even with A Link to the Past, there was room for some exploration, uh, especially when you hit the Dark World, then you had, it opened up a little bit more after you did the first palace anyway. But from there on, it, that's kind of where it came to a halt for future games. Nintendo had, you know, they perfected their formula of getting to, you know, explore a tiny piece of the map. And, you know, essentially finding a dungeon, getting an item there, and using that item as a key to unlock another part of the map. It wasn't until Wind Waker where we really got more freedom with the sailing mechanic. Uh, finally, with, you know, the coming of A Link Between Worlds, they went back to their original roots. Now we could fully explore the world all over again. This was the closest we were going to get to Zelda 1, right? Enter Breath of the Wild. Holy crap, this game starts off strong, doesn't it? It does! For those of you who don't know, uh, or haven't played it yet, just so you know, or you're, you are aware, uh, I am going to probably have some spoilers in this. Uh, I'm letting you know because I feel to give the most honest review, uh, there are certain things I want to go into detail about that others might not have talked about in their reviews. So you've been warned. Seriously. Spoilers. Anyway. So Link wakes up from a hundred year old coma to the voice of Zelda, grabs a tablet, walks outside, and bam, you're off. Uh, you see an old man to really drive home that whole, hey, remember Zelda 1? We do. Feel. <laughs> and uh, from there you can go explore the Great Plateau. There's a tower marked on your map uh, you go to the tower, you climb to the top, you put your Sheikah Slate in there, and it awakens towers all across the land. It also gives you a chunk of the map, like it, it, it actually unlocks the map for you to see. Uh, it's also a great area so you can get a you know, good lay of the land and see what's around, and you can decide where you want to go next. After this, you've got four shrines you need to go find. Shrines are basically the mini dungeons. Uh, Think like the WarioWare micro games of dungeons. Not, since, not in the sense that they're like crazy fast and chaotic, but just that the sense that they're very small and there's a crap ton of them. Uh, the first four are pretty straightforward. You go in and you're given a new ability. Um, now seeing as I went into this game completely blind, this alone actually set my expectations too high. Uh, and it's actually where I started to have a couple of grievances with the game as a whole, but we'll get to more on that later. You see, the Great Plateau is a mandatory tutorial, essentially, but it doesn't hold your hand. It's a great place to learn how to cook, fight, explore, collect, whatever. 
Uh, once you beat the first four shrines, the entire map opens up to you. From here, you're told where you should go, but that's it. I actually find it hilarious that the first quest in the game is destroy again because, I mean, it's just so to the point. Now, I did end up following the story for just a little bit. Uh, you're basically told to go to Kakariko Village uh, and meet with Empa and learn some things. Uh, after doing this, I would recommend that anybody new starting the game do it as well because it does unlock some abilities for your tablet, which is nice to have. That way you don't miss out on things later on. But realistically, you can go and do that kind of stuff whenever you want to. You see, this game is big, like real big. Uh, you've probably heard people compare it to Skyrim, which land-wise, I feel is pretty fair. But the more I thought about it, the comparison pretty much ends there. Exploring it right off the bat was such a great feeling. I streamed the game on launch day from the Switch, and before I knew it, I had put in 15 hours straight. It was addicting, to say the least. Uh, remembering that I'm an adult with, you know, life responsibilities, I reluctantly turned it off, but it wasn't too much longer uh, that I was right back into it with another 15 hour session. Now, while you're welcome to play the game however you wish, be that explore and go find all 120, yes, 120 shrines or all 900 Koroks, or if you want, just go straight to Ganon. You also have the option of acquiring all of Link's missing memories, as well as taking on the four divine beasts, which serve as dungeons, I guess? You see, this is where the thoughts of, is this game truly as great as everybody says it is, started to creep into my head. I'll just dive right into what I believe to be the biggest issues with the game, but I'll be sure to mention all the good things that I really like about the game at the very end, that way you can hate me just a little bit less. Um, first off, this game has no dungeons. None. It has 120 shrines, which some might argue is too many. And it has four divine beasts, which are essentially just bigger shrines. Now, don't get me wrong, the shrines are fun, uh, for the most part, but some of them can also be very repetitive. You see, each shrine contains a puzzle, which, if you're clever, can be solved with multiple solutions. Uh, there's other shrines that are combat shrines, and some of them are just, you did it, here's a chest. And that's it. Now, the most fun tend to be the former, as they often involve using your Sheikah Slate abilities that you got on the Great Plateau, for some fun physics-based puzzles. Uh, the combat trials tend to be very repetitive, and there seem to be a lot of them. Uh, what's worse is there's only three difficulties. Uh, if you can beat the major versions, then you can beat the other two that come before it with no problem. Uh, the combat trial basically consists of you fighting a Guardian Scout one-on-one, -on -one, and that's it. Uh, each level boosts its damage and health, but they never add other scouts or any other enemies or do anything really to change the difficulty. It's just the same fight over and over again. Uh, lastly are the you did it shrines. Uh, basically it's a shrine where if, if it's pretty well hidden and requires a quest to enter, most of the time you're rewarded with a treasure chest and a spirit orb and that's it. What are spirit orbs? Uh, they're the rewards for beating shrines. They're basically the replacement for heart pieces. But they can also be used to give you more stamina if you so choose. Uh, other than shrines we have the divine beasts which are basically bigger shrines. Each one starts off the same. You're told, literally told, uh, to go find a map before immediately being shown where it is. This is a game that forces you to find the map of the entire world on your own, mind you. Uh, from there, you have to explore and activate a handful of nodes uh, before fighting the boss. Each divine beast has a little gimmick that you can control on the map, be it like, uh, making the elephant spray water into different rooms, or moving a salamander to change the layout of the whole area. Uh, on paper, this sounds cool, except they really fall short. First, each node is clearly marked on your map, which really gets away from your whole sense of exploration. Uh, upon finding each one, you get talked to, basically saying, Hey, congratulations, you did it! Go find five more! And it gets really old after one but it does it for every node you find. So repeat that for every node, and then repeat that again for every Divine Beast. You know, for a game that doesn't hold your hand in the slightest, it's when it comes to the world itself, it's like right when you think you're gonna get a taste of that sweet, sweet dungeon life, 
they suddenly summon their inner Navi, Tattle, Midna, Ezio, Fi, 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 to guide you through slightly larger shrines. And keep in mind, Divine Beasts aren't that big. There's no enemies to defeat, uh, there's the occasional goopy eyeball, that's it. There's no mini bosses, no, nothing, no items, not even a damn key. They honestly felt like a monumental letdown. Uh, and after doing my first Divine Beast, I still had hope uh, until I did the second and then I realized they were all going to be the same and it really didn't give me much hope for Hyrule Castle at that point. Now let's move on to the second issue. The expectations game gave me with the shrines. Now this could be on me um, because you know when I first got in those first four shrines I was given an ability and it was awesome and it was cool and fun to use. I had just assumed I was going to get an ability for every single shrine that I found. I didn't know that there were 120 shrines going into this. Uh, so when I found my first shrine outside of the Great Plateau, I was pumped. And I was ready to get some sort of new ability and or an item or whatever and see what's going to happen. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Nor did it happen for the next 115 that I found in the world. Uh, obviously, after a few shrines, I realized that you know, I wasn't going to be getting any new abilities and that what I had was all I was going to get. But that still left me pretty disappointed. Uh, being handed all the tools at the very beginning of the game takes away such an opportunity to reward the pl or player for finding things. You know, at least in A Link Between Worlds, you had the ability to buy items, but you couldn't afford them all at once. And so you had to pick and choose. And even then, the dungeon still had you finding things like tunic upgrades or a better shield or things to upgrade your sword with. You know, it makes me feel like, to a degree, Zelda 1 still handled open world better than Breath of the Wild. You see, in Zelda 1, uh, each dungeon you found left you wondering what item you're going to find in them. Uh, some of them were even necessary to gain access to some parts of the map, such as the raft or the ladder. Uh, the lack of items and the expectation that I'd be getting more left me wanting more. Uh, the abilities that Sheikah Slate has are certainly neat, but they aren't really practical for combat aside from kiting with bombs and tend to only really exist to solve puzzles and shrines. That takes us into our third issue, uh, items. Now, I know a lot of people complain about the durability system, and while I didn't find it to be the greatest, I never really did find myself completely lacking in weapons. There are plenty to sitting around just to find, and you know, it does get tedious when you think you're going to find this awesome weapon only for it to shatter 15 swings later. But some of the earlier games, like from like, the earlier game items, like from Zelda 1 or, you know, Link to the Past or whatever, like the Magical Wand and the Boomerang, uh, those have been converted into just normal weapons, which means they too can break. Swung that Magic Wand too much? Sorry, it's gone forever now. Uh, it, it, you know, I feel like this could have been handled a bit better. Uh, such as maybe giving, you know, Magic Wand the same treatment the Master Sword gets, or even adding a Magic Meter. Treating a Boomerang like a special item that doesn't shatter would be nice too. Uh, now, seeing as I mentioned the Master Sword, let's go ahead and talk about that. It's dumb. And weak. So, the way the Master Sword works is that upon finding it, you must pull it first, but you need to have sufficient hearts to be able to do so, which is pretty cool. Uh, but once you've acquired the Blade of Evil's Bane, you are immediately told that it can run out of juice and will need to recharge. Yep. The Master Sword has been reduced to a battery-operated weapon. Uh, after so many swings, it essentially breaks, and it stays in your inventory, but then 10 minutes later, it'll pop back to life with its fully charged and whopping... 30 attack. I don't know why I put quotes around 30 attack and not whopping. Whatever. Did I mention it only has 30 attack? Because uh, by the time you get it, you'll probably already have much stronger weapons. Sure, it goes up to 60 when you're fighting Guardians or anything linked to Ganon, which basically just means things in Hyrule Castle. But when you're out in the field just fighting Moblins and the like, nope. Back to 30. The Master Sword was handled in this game seemed really silly. You're basically giving 
us a weapon that has such an incredibly low base damage. Like, if you're gonna give us a weapon that has such a low base damage, maybe at least have it so it doesn't break. You know, maybe give us something to, where we can have a do a quest to solidify the power, getting it to a point where it won't break. Uh, something. Anything. Uh, because as it stands, it's basically just a weak sword that takes up a slot in my inventory next to bigger and better weapons. Like my Savage Lionel Sword that has 90 attack. 90! If we could upgrade the sword uh, with a smith or a fairy to make it stronger, that might have balanced things out. But as it stands, the Blade of Evil's Bane is just a weak sword that sometimes glows. Fourth, and perhaps one of the last of the big issues, is the replayability of the game. Now, I could be wrong here, but I do feel a lot of reviews were written before they actually completed the game. They were most likely written after running around for like 15 hours or so. And you see that's a problem, because the thing with Breath of the Wild, unfortunately doesn't seem to have, is replayability. Uh, when you first acquire the game, it's a magical, wonderful experience. The thrill of finding new shrines and new areas is awesome. You're constantly wondering what you're going to encounter next. But you're never going to get that feeling ever again. Breath of the Wild does not feel like a Zelda game that I'd ever want to go back and immediately replay, or even replay after quite a long time. And in that regard, it fails as an open world game. Take an Elder Scrolls game, for example. Uh, the replayability comes from the customization of your character. Maybe one playthrough you want to play as a mage. Uh, maybe next time you want to play as a stealth archer. Maybe you want to join Faction A. Maybe next time you want to join Faction B to destroy Faction A. Uh, there are many options and many quests. Uh, each one, you know, provides you with, you know, different loot, abilities, etc. Combined with the radiant nature of things, it gives you a lot more opportunities. With Zelda, though, your options are to play through it and find all 120 shrines again? Or maybe just go fight Ganon? The thrill of finding new shrines and things is gone, and that was like 95% of the thrill. Okay, uh, I know I've complained a lot here, but honestly I don't view this so much as like senseless whining, uh, but more or less actually being critical of the game. I'll reiterate, I did find the game to be fun. I, I had a blast when I played through it. It's the fact that, you know, I was still left with these these feelings of emptiness that I wanted to discuss. Uh, and I can't be the only one to feel this stuff, right? With that being said, let's move back into the uh, danger zone. Enemies. Oh, man. Enemies. There are not enough enemies. Remember Zelda 1? We had... Armos, Bubble, Darknut, Gel, Guinea, Gibdo, Goria, Keys, Lanmola, Lever, Like Like, Lionel, Moblin, Moldorm, Octorok, Patra, Pihat, Pole's Voice, Rope, Stalfos, Tektite, Vire, Wallmaster, Wizrobe, Zol, Zora. How about a link to the past? I won't list them all, but there were over 120 enemies in that game. That's not even including bosses. Now, to those of you who want to be like, Oh, but AJ, those are just the 2D games. What about the 3D? Models are so much harder to make. Uh, let me just point you towards Ocarina of Time, then. There's close to 70 enemies in that game. Or 80 in Twilight Princess. What sort of variety do we have in Breath of the Wild? Well, I hope you like seeing the same three types of enemies recycled over and over and over and over again across the entire game. Because that's what you're going to get. Boko Blends, Moblins, and Lizzleflos. Get used to those, because you'll encounter those and their variants that fight the exact same all across Hyrule. <laughs> yeah, you might see the occasional keys, maybe a chew that pops up only be, to be destroyed immediately. Uh, that's it. Now we do have like, you know, Lynels and Hynex, but those are more reserved for the role of mini boss across Hyrule, which I still don't get why Lynels don't get an actual mini boss health bar, but okay. Uh, but those are few and far between. If you're in the cold, Bokoblins, Moblins, and Lizifuls. Maybe you're in the tropical area down in Floria. Bokoblins, Moblins, and Lizifuls. How about Death Mountain? Bokoblins, Moblins, Lizifuls. You see, the earlier games had so many more enemies and had them spanning across Hyrule's various regions. 
Yeah, they had their variants, but nowhere near as many Lizzo-Holz varieties as you're going to see in Breath of the Wild. Those things are everywhere. The different enemies really set the tone for the regions that you were in, or the dungeons that you were in. They felt like they belonged there, like they fit in. And Breath of the Wild, that's gone, and it ruins part of the immersion. Yeah, you might see an occasional wizrobe, but why is it there? Like, what reason does a wizrobe have to just be prancing around Floria of all places? These are always been like a top tier enemy, and they're not even guarding Hyrule Castle. Instead, we have endless amounts of guardians all over, which, yeah, makes sense, but it's also been a hundred years. Ganon hasn't moved his monsters in yet? Actually, that's uh, something to think about right there. It's been 100 years. Keep in mind that the heroes lost. Ganon won. So, 100 years after Ganon's victory, how is Hyrule not really a darker place? How are there not enemies just everywhere? In Ocarina of Time, Ganon changes things pretty drastically in the span of, what, seven years? I realize this Ganon's more of a malevolent force than anything, but wouldn't that mean that the darkness and the evil should spread faster? That brings us to Ganon. Whole oh, rootin' tootin' beam shootin' calamity Ganon! <laughs> I can't possibly be the only one who's disappointed here, right? Ganon as a character is an institution. Starting from A Link to the Past, he's had personality. He's ruthless, conniving, evil, intelligent. Breath of the Wild is a mindless Dark Souls enemy. This is not my Ganon. Remember how cool and calm he was in Wind Waker? The years like made him wise and in that wisdom a sense of bitterness grew? Or that in Twilight Princess, Ganon was manipulative and cruel, twisted and evil, focusing more on power and revenge? So when it comes to Calamity Ganon, he has no personality. He's just a force. An evil, generic, malevolent force. He looks nothing even resembling Ganon until his second form. Why does he have a giant laser cannon? He existed before the Guardians. He won after he corrupted them. So why does he look more like a Guardian and less like a Gerudo Sorcerer? He's just a big cluster of blue laser weapons attached to his skull. The fight itself, if you freed all the Divine Beasts, is even more lame. They do so much damage to him, and by the time you reach him, you're most likely entirely overpowered. The Divine Beasts should have made Hyrule Castle easier, not the final boss. There are barely enough bosses in the game, so why mess up our experience with the final boss? Why make the final boss such a joke? The, the second form, while looking cool, was unfortunately a huge letdown as well. I mean, horse riding in this game wasn't as uh, fun as it should have been. It always kind of felt a little wonky and disjointed, so doing the whole final fight on the horse felt awkward. But in my experience, it didn't really matter because if you weren't directly in front of him, you would take literally no damage at all anyway. I, I mean, I know my horse got blasted at some point and died after I gave up riding it, and I just basically would just use the wind to get to where I needed to go to fight him. And that was it. I, I, remember, I remember playing A Link to the Past and being fully geared up and wondering if I was still going to be able to be Ganon or not. And because I hit, because he hit hard, and he had moves that were hard to touch. You know, you had to play very carefully just not to waste your potions or your fairies against him. This Ganon, this Kalei Ganon, was a huge letdown. Finally was the cooking. I say finally, but they'll probably be more. Uh, this mechanic seemed like it was such a cool feature to have, until I realized what a big, dumb, broken mess it was. Y you see... You don't even get an easy recipe book after you like discover various things. It'd be nice if you create something and then it goes into a book and then you can select that recipe from the book and instantly create it. Uh, instead, you just have to remember everything you made. But the biggest issue with that was once you discover that any item that gives you hearts will give you a full heal instantly too. And I discovered that quite early on, which essentially kind of broke the game for me. You could take a single truffle or a single radish and cook it and it would give you a full heal plus an extra harder or three depending on what the item was why bother with veggies why bother with meats why bother with fish or mushrooms or anything when you can just stock your inventory full of perfectly big healing items 
Combine that with Mifa's instant revive and maybe a couple of fairies and you're a walking tank. You know, the previous games give you four bottles and with that you had to decide if you wanted healing items, fairies, a bee, or, you know, maybe like some water or magic, you know, and, and that was all you had. Those are the options that you could do. This, you just get page after page after page of, of healing items. Breath of the, you know, it makes it so in Breath of the Wild, you're, you have nearly an endless assortment of heals. And there is no worry of ever dying. The beginning of the game, yeah, you might have some deaths. But the balance has shifted so far in your favor so quickly, especially if you discover things like I did, unfortunately, that it just saps a lot of the enjoyment from the game. See, that's a big part of Breath of the Wild, is it's almost entirely too open. When do you do the Divine Beasts? When you're entirely too weak or entirely too strong? Is there really any way of knowing? No, unless the, the Divine Beasts don't even have an order to them, and because there's no enemies in them anyway, there's really not much that they could do to change the difficulty of them. If Nintendo had decided to make it so these dungeons could be done in any order, but it was there was a suggested order for you to go in, they would have a great reason for some dungeons to be harder than others. Instead, they went with the route that of treating every dungeon like it might be your first, and therefore, that was it. The problem, then, is the fact that if you find the difficulty to be just right when you do one of them, then it's best to go do them all right after that. Otherwise, they're all going to be too easy way too fast. That alone creates another problem, though, because all the dungeons are pretty much the same length, so once you finish them, you really have nothing else to look forward to besides Hyrule Castle, which itself isn't even treated like a real dungeon. There are multiple places in Hyrule Castle to go and explore and get lost in, but you can just ignore them all and head straight to the end. Yet again. You don't even have to put in the, any, any work in the final dungeon. If you don't want to, uh, you know, sure, you could go and find more shrines, but now that you're trading, but then, you know, you're trading in that dungeon experience back for little micro dungeons to hold you over until you decide to beat the game. So the balance just feels off. In previous Zelda games, each dungeon got longer and longer to complement their higher level of difficulty. Look at Majora's Mask. That game only had four dungeons, but each one was more daunting than the last. You know, the Stone Temple dungeon is not to be trifled with on day three, or even too far into day two because of how easy it is to get lost in. Stone Temple Tower. Before you destroy me in the comments. As for some smaller little complaints, no caves. This Hyrule is huge, but we don't have any caves to explore. Nothing on the level of, of moving a gravestone and finding a cool place to explore underneath it. The overworld is really all there is. And I say that lightly, but again, even other open world games like Skyrim have caves, dwarven ruins, etc. all to explore, really tying together this like vast underground network. The lack of music was unfortunate, but I do understand why. Uh, there was some really good tunes in the game too, but not having any motivational music was sort of a letdown. You know, I, I, I lost my mind when I realized the music that was being played in Death Mountain was the final dungeon music from Zelda 1. I thought that was awesome. Uh, but we still needed some good overworld music. Uh, something to really just drive that adventure feel home. Uh, I got very sick of the uh, music that was played in the cold areas. And again, I get trying to make it more atmospheric, but Zelda is known for having such great themes. You know, be it the nor the normal overworld main theme, uh, I keep doing this, um, or Tall Tall Heights from Link to the Past, not Link to the Past, Link's Awakening, again before comments destroy me, or whatever music is important, and it was severely lacking here. Look, Breath of the Wild was a fun game, it was. I realize that there was a lot of complaints here, but honestly, it's just because I care a lot about the series. I want to see it improve and I want to see it grow. If the next Zelda could somehow be a mixture of this style with taking elements of the classic gameplay, such as more dungeons, enemies, areas to explore, etc., that'd be wonderful. You know, I've noticed a lot of everyone who seems to give this game like a 10 out of 10 is purely doing that because it, it's an open world Zelda and they're not being critical enough of it. Did I have fun? Absolutely. I, you know, I had a lot of awesome moments even, like that final memory that you find, spoilers. Uh, hearing the music go from, you know, the main theme to, to, to Zelda's theme to Fee's, that was an awesome touch. You know, the, the ragdoll physics were a blast to play around with. 
Exploration at the start felt fresh and exciting. Combat, especially against Lynels, it was pretty good for a while. You know, a lot of what was said in these like 10 out of 10 reviews is accurate, but I just felt like they were only looking at the good things. I'm viewing this game as a 30 year lifelong fan of the series. Perhaps my expectations were, were high, but it's because the series put them that high by being so successful and doing so much right. You know, I have to be critical because, well, somebody had to be, right? Thank you guys so much for managing to sit through this entire thing if you uh, were able to do so. I had no idea it was going to be as long as it was. Uh, in the future, I don't think any of my videos will be nearly this long. Uh, in the meantime, though, if you do want to follow me elsewhere, uh, you can check me out on Twitch. I stream there uh, quite, a, quite a bit, actually. And um, you can also check me out on Twitter. Both of those things are on the screen, and there's also going to be links down below. Okay, bye.